Hi, I'm Brad Sobolewski, one of the emergency medicine attendings, and this board review... Hi, I'm Brad Sobolewski, one of your emergency medicine attendings, and this board review presentation focuses on child abuse. It's unfortunately something that you will all see when you're working in the ED. As a pediatrician, you are mandated to report child abuse. The highest rate of maltreatment is in the birth to one-year-old age range and child abuse occurs in children of all races, ethnicities, and socioeconomic groups. Specific risk factors include conditions that interfere with bonding, such as prematurity, neonatal separation, or multiple birth, congenital defects and disabilities, behavior such as hyperactivity, a caretaker with a history of abuse, young parents, mental illness, substance abuse, poverty and financial stress, living in a home with unrelated adults, and siblings of abused children are also at risk. Key characteristics that should clue you into physical abuse include a vague or unknown history of how the child sustained the injury, an injury history that is not appropriate for the child's age and development, it's not compatible with the injury that you see, or it's inconsistent either over time or between witnesses. You should be worried if there's an unexplained delay in seeking medical care. A history of recurrent injuries, especially those with inconsistent explanations, and especially if there's a history of an abused sibling or the unexplained death of a sibling. Remember, those who cannot cruise rarely bruise. Look out for patients with ear, face, and intraoral injuries. Those are highly suggestive of abuse. Bruises that are patterned and in multiple stages of healing. You should definitely know accidental skull burns versus forced immersion injuries and cigarette burns. Traumatic brain injury in non-accidental trauma is a leading cause of death in children under the age of one. Infants with abusive head injuries frequently have subdural and are subarachnoid hemorrhages. Most have bilateral retinal hemorrhages as well. Some babies that have injuries to the skull and scalp because of impact with the floor or crib. A child with a serious inflicted head injury can have no external signs of trauma. Half though have bruises, a quarter have a long bone fracture, and one in 25 have an intra-abdominal injury. Skull fractures due to abuse, if present, are often extensive and complicated as compared with the simple linear fractures that are most likely to be caused by a fall of a short distance. In child abuse, 90% of fractures that are caused by abuse are seen in children younger than five years of age. 50% of fractures in children younger than one are attributable to abuse, and 30% of fractures in children younger than three years of age are attributable to abuse. Key fractures to know for the boards include the corner or bucket handle fracture, a complex skull fracture, not a simple linear one, rib fractures, the femur in the non-ambulatory child, and multiple bilateral fractures in various states of healing. Let's talk a little bit about factitious disorder imposed on another, formerly known as Munchausen by proxy. This is where the caregiver, most frequently the mother, exaggerates, fabricates, or creates illness symptoms in the child, resulting in undergoing multiple tests, procedures, and hospitalizations that they did not need. Specific examples that may be seen on board exams include fictitious hematuria, diarrhea due to laxatives, repeated apparent brewies such as suffocation, poisoning, recurrent sepsis due to injection or infection with feces. 30% of these kids have underlying medical problems as well, meaning that it's very hard to tease this out. You should always use a standardized physical abuse guideline. You can pause and reference the one that we use here locally. Sexual abuse is the involvement of the child or adolescent in sexual activities that they do not comprehend, to which they are unable to consent, or which violate societal norms. Behavioral things that should clue you into sexual abuse include excessive masturbation, developmentally inappropriate explicit sexual behaviors, and nonspecific things such as poor school performance, anxiety, and suicidal gestures. Physical findings can be specific such as genital or rectal lacerations or unintended pregnancy, or nonspecific such as anorexia, abdominal pain, dysuria, vaginal discharge, or sleep problems. Vaginal discharge alone is a low risk for sexual abuse, but it still requires consideration and workup. Remember, a normal exam does not rule out sexual abuse. In the prepubescent child, a speculum exam is contraindicated. Any internal exam should be done with a gynecologist under general anesthesia. In the differential, you should include straddle injuries, which rarely injure the hymen unless the child falls on a sharp object. Vulvovaginitis, labial adhesions, urethral prolapse, lichen sclerosis, and even diaper rash are also in consideration. 
STI is only seen in 5%. Infants and young children can have perinatally acquired infections, including HPV, HSV, HIV, syphilis, and chlamydia. Testing includes cultures, nucleic acid amplification tests, and serology for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, TRIC, HIV, Hep B, Hep C, and HSV, among others. You should always follow local evaluation protocols, including a single forensic interview. If the child spontaneously discloses abuse to you, then document this verbatim in the medical record because such statements are admissible in court.